testing the limits of his ability and his soul. The gold has Canada's Kurt Browning waiting to entertain the world. It is why Nancy Kerrigan is managing to fight on to defy cruel fate. Twice golden, still the enchanting Katerina Witt is called again by a mesmerizing mystique, a prize without equal. From a Russian Republic, the orphaned Oksana Bayul has found a purpose in the pursuit of an Olympic championship. From St. Petersburg, Mishka Tunik and Dmitriev, champions once, seek a challenge again, seek a final meeting with a rival couple, an exquisite pair from Moscow, Gordayeva and Grinkov. And Torval and Dean, a decade ago on top of the world, they too search for the summit once more. The best, the beautiful, the brightest, Dorothy Hamill's gold medal preview, and now your host, 1976 ladies single gold medalist, Dorothy Hamill. Hello and welcome to our gold medal preview. Figure skating has become the centerpiece of the Olympic Winter Games. With its drama, the usual intrigue, the inevitable tension, it's Hollywood style entertainment. And this time around, add to all that something unique, a dream competition. Pro skaters have been reinstated for these games. And that means the best from the past will be colliding with today's outstanding skaters in an extraordinary, unprecedented blend of talent. But the presence of the pros won't be the only big story at the upcoming Olympics in Norway. The whole world will also be following the progress of America's Nancy Kerrigan, assaulted in a horrifying incident at the U.S. Nationals. A little later in the show, you'll see complete coverage of the attack, including as yet unseen footage and we'll talk about Nancy's Olympic prospects. But first, to begin our gold medal preview, the gold medalist at the 1988 Calgary Games, he's a 30-year-old with a troublesome knee, steely nerves, and a big heart, Brian Boitano. After the Calgary Olympics, Brian Boitano began a successful ice show teaming with ladies Olympic champion, Katerina Witt. His skating had become the standard by which all others were compared. He won five consecutive World Professional Championships, but for Brian, a new challenge was a most welcome thought. I wouldn't have done this. I wouldn't have come back unless I expected myself to be really good. And so I have to, to live every day with the fact that I've, I've reinstated and I, I need to keep pushing myself. I have, to, I have to be the quality that I wanted to be, the reason that I wanted to come back to this sport, of the, the amateur side of this sport, and compete in the Olympics is because I wanted to be at a certain level, and I'm not there yet. After finishing second at Skate America to Victor Petrenko, and second again to Scott Davis at the U.S. Nationals, many wonder if he still can beat the world's best. It was so much pressure with everybody expecting so much. I, I think uh, taking for granted that I would win was a very difficult position for me to be put in because I never take anything for granted. Um, I wanted to earn my place on the team and in a certain way maybe this will help me uh, perform better at the Olympics because it will let a little bit of the pressure off me uh, being second place going into Lillehammer. One pressure that won't go away is a battered, painful knee that has troubled him throughout his comeback. I wish I could push my body a little bit more. I wish I could work a little bit more with my knee, but I can't. Um, so I have to deal with that. Hopefully now I can maybe add a little bit more going into the Olympics because my knee's feeling better and better. The game plan is to just keep practicing and doing, you know, the, the extra triples, the extra three triples that I need to do um, before the Olympics. Um, the program and my conditioning is really, I think it's right there. I think I just need to continue um, on the road of, of doing consistent long programs and short programs and concentrate on putting those three triples in because I think the three triples are the key um, to me doing a performance that I expect for myself. I think Brian is his own best and worst critic and he's a perfectionist. I think that's a part of Brian. I think that's what makes him successful. 
I don't think that was coached at all. I, I think I would like to have him have less of it so that he could be more at peace with himself. Uh, because sometimes even when he's fabulous, it's still not enough for him. Five years after claiming the sport's greatest prize, Brian Boitano is pushing himself again. This time for different reasons, motivated by something deeper. And his search for excellence has inevitably brought him back to the Olympic Games. The eyes of the man who surprised. He was more than Boitano's equal at the Nationals. Conquering the 1988 Olympic champion, Scott Davis of Great Falls, Montana, exploded into the national limelight at Joe Louis Arena, bringing the house to its feet with a performance that combined art, intensity, and superb execution. When I was younger, I had gone into the rink and I thought about, okay, I'll do set my little goals and see how far I can get. And the Olympics was the ultimate dream. And tonight I reached it and I can't believe it. <laughs> Davis, voted the 1993 Skater of the Year, is unassuming off the ice. But what a contrast when he performs. Bold, focused, smooth, his jumps tight, his spins ferocious, and at the Nationals, he claimed a well-deserved victory. Skating has been known to wait your turn, and um, the judging has often been criticized. And I, I think this was uh, a great coup for skating. The media and the public often laugh about our judging system and often feel like they don't judge what they see. And they obviously did this time. Still ahead, the attack and the aftermath. Nancy Kerrigan's difficult road. And next, Kurt Browning, Canada's best hope for gold in Norway. Dorothy Hamill's gold medal preview. Welcome back to our gold medal preview. Now we focus on a born performer who many consider the world's best in men's singles. But Kurt Browning of Edmonton, Canada, is still waiting to prove it on the sport's biggest stage. Carolina. I used to play a lot of hockey and I used to figure skate at the same time. It really bothered other guys. They liked to tease me, especially the guys on the teams we used to play hockey against. This is for all those guys that ever teased me or wondered why I was figure skating. Stay tuned, watch this, you'll figure it out. Hi, I'm Kurt Brown, Canada's four time world figure skating champion. Kurt Browning is a winner. He grabbed his fourth world championship last year, but he's yet to strike Olympic gold. And to earn that prize, confidence is a must. In Prague, I was the one in control of my destiny. And when my music came on, it was me who was in charge, not necessarily an injury or a nagging feeling of being scared. And uh, I, I don't know who can skate scared, really. And I've never, ever skated scared before. That is until 1992, when Browning took to the Olympic ice in Alberville as one of the favorites, then had his ambition doused by uncertainty. And in Albertville, I felt like someone else was pulling the strings, that, um, that if I'd have just had another month or maybe another couple months, that I would have been ready for this. Uh, but I felt like I just walked into a, a room full of people, was expected to give a speech, and I was wearing my boxer shorts. Really, I just didn't feel comfortable there. I learned so much from Albertville, and I learned a lot about my own character and, and who I am and what my skating is to me. And it's not necessarily winning the Olympics, that's for sure. After his Olympic disappointment, Browning dedicated himself to preparing, fully realizing now the enormity of what's ahead. The Olympics is almost like this momentous event that comes from the heavens, and the whole world is interested. So people who never watch figure skating are now watching figure skating. And um, all those things make it the center of the world for about four and a half minutes. I think that's what's different. At these Olympics, a field with reinstated pros could keep Kurt from becoming Canada's first Olympic champion. At the Olympics, I think it's going to be great because we've got Brian Botano, Victor Petrani. We've got the best skaters going in the world right now, and they're going to be on the ice at the same time. And it's, it's going to make for a worldwide classic skating event. Uh, it's going to make my job a lot harder. But it'd be really good to beat Brian Boitano. 
I've never really been able to compete against him on par. When he retired, I still was sort of coming up. And so I think that we're both looking forward to competing against each other on par. And uh, I hope we both have a good day. Although Kurt's positive attitude has taken him to great heights, the memories of his Olympic setback still loom large. For Kurt, the best way to forget that dark time is to perform just once as he's imagined, perfectly. So if I have a fantasy, I want four and a half minutes of ballsy, I'm not gonna miss anything, I'm having so much fun, watch how great this jump is gonna be, feeling. That's, that's what I'd like. Who cares what medal I get? If I had that during the Olympic Games and stop at the end and just stand there and smile at the people, and, mm, I think that's what I'd like. Ahead on our gold medal preview, he's as cool as ice, Canada's Elvis Stoiko. There are many in skating who'd like to see Kurt Browning unleash the performance of his life. And in Lillehammer, he'll probably need to skate almost perfectly considering the depth of talent expected on the Olympic ice. Among those who'll challenge Browning is a countryman, a fellow Canadian, and a free spirit whose charisma may remind some a little bit of his namesake. Folks, Elvis will be going to Norway. More than 40 years ago, the United States was introduced to the king of rock and roll, Elvis Presley. His hysteria-inducing, hip-shaking sent shockwaves across America. Recently, Canada introduced a new Elvis to the world. Whoever said the king was dead? Elvis Presley had the golden voice. Elvis Stoiko has golden aspirations. This 21-year-old from Ontario is one of Canada's brightest figure skating stars and his search for his own fame started early. Ever since I was little, I've always really pushed myself and really gone towards the top. No matter what I placed, 10th, 11th, 12th, I was still gearing for the top, and I was able to push through it and get to higher and higher to my goal. This Ice King knows he can't waltz into the winner's circle, so unlike some in the sport, he's committed to practice. I guess the outlook and the total training concept will be towards gearing up for the Olympics. At home, I train about uh, like five days a week. Uh, I don't train weekends. I usually take off because I train really hard during the week. I like to relax. Elvis's definition of relaxation doesn't reside in the dictionary, and he doesn't know the meaning of the word scared. He's ignoring the pressure of his lofty position. Being ranked number two is basically a spot that I've, I've taken at Worlds in Prague, and you can say that like some skaters were carried around with them all year, but for me, I don't carry it around with me. I, I, I sort of put it back up on the shelf. This skate king can be shaken, however. In fact, when he heard that the pros were back in the Olympics, he was sort of all shook up. At first, when I heard about the, the, the rule about Boitano and the professionals coming back, first, I didn't, I didn't like the idea. I wasn't for it to the fact that They've had their time, it's over, let, you know, let the younger skaters come through and do their own thing. And now that uh, the rule has gone by and, and everything's sort of happened, then you can't really change anything. But, uh, you know, I've accepted it and, and now I'm on to, to do my own thing and uh, I'm out there to compete whoever is going to show up. The king isn't dead. Elvis is coming to Norway. Up next, the stirring, splendid ways of the young man from Kiev. He's back to defend his Olympic title Victor Petrenko. And coming up, exclusive coverage of the attack on Olympian Nancy Kerrigan. Maria is presented by KitchenAid for the way it's made. The 12th Olympic Winter Games, Innsbruck, Austria. And the world was captivated by a 19-year-old from Riverside, Connecticut, Dorothy Hamill. When I was standing on the podium in 1976 and the American flag was being raised, and they were playing the national anthem. I remember feeling so many different thoughts and emotions. It's everything from, gosh, I can't believe I've fulfilled my lifelong dream, to a little bit afraid, great sense of relief. You know, you don't know what's ahead, but you thank heavens it's all over. And, and, and really, you know, thinking of my parents and my, the whole team that it takes, not just me, that it was my mom and my dad and my coaches, and that all that hard work finally paid off for everybody. 
For decades, there was a sports machine successful beyond all others. The Soviet Union nurtured its athletes from childhood, guiding them toward Olympic success, toward a day when they would bring honor, glory, and publicity to the Soviet state. Now that empire is gone, but the echoes remain. Skaters trained the Soviet way are still with us, still dominating. And among them, among the last of what may be a dying breed, is the defending Olympic champion, a Ukrainian whose love of competition runs deep. I feel happy because the old's over and very good for me, because it's my dream to be an Olympic champion. Almost two years ago, this is what we saw. The consummate artist, his expressive performance, the fluid motion. The work of this master was awe-inspiring. At the Albertville Olympics, his piercing blades carved a work of art on a white canvas. Victor Petrenko had his treasured masterpiece. He is truly like the old-fashioned athlete, that he does it for the joy of the sport. He loves the training. He loves to compete. He loves to be in the shape of his life. He performs for the audience, but first and foremost, he's an athlete. After Albertville, Victor had tunnel vision. He was heading for the bright lights of the big show. It was time to drop the curtain on a great amateur career. But the warmth of the Olympic spirit never left his heart, and when he was reinstated, he had a chance to pursue something special, back-to-back -back golds. First of all, I've got the professional feeling of the competing and how I have to be in front of the people, how I have to do my practicing and actually I learn a lot from the professional and I learn a lot how I ha can perform and what I have to do for this. What Victor gained from his time as a pro was invaluable. His self-confidence was fueled and though his bank account is suffering, the new Victor needed this Olympic comeback. I said, Victor, you will lose three quarters of a million to a million dollars. Two tours, professional competitions, all the exhibitions. What if you finish fifth? What if it hurts your reputation? And Victor says, I am 22 years old. I am an athlete. The Olympics says, I can come back, be reinstated. I go back. I am athlete. I feel like an athlete. That's why I made, made a decision to turn back to amateur. And I know the professional will come in back and I'll get enough time to be professional. Next on our gold medal preview, the favorites in what should be the best Olympic pairs competition ever. When we return. This will be the second Olympics for Jenny Mino and Todd Sand, but their first together. Each had a different partner at the 1992 Olympics in Albertville, France. Now, whether or not this new association produces a medal in Norway, you might say Mino and Sand have already shared something of value. They've learned that sport and romance can mix. Though Todd Sand was sporting a shiner from a recent practice snafu, he and Jenny Mino are at the moment living happily ever after. Well, Todd and I spend a lot of time together off the ice. Um, we spend most of our time together on and off the ice, and I think we have a very special relationship that a lot of other pair teams might not have, and I think that shows in our skating. Love can do funny things, and it may have been the missing ingredient for Mino and Sand. A fifth place at the 93 Worlds was good, but taking gold at the U.S. Nationals was better, a perfect prelude to Norway. I think it was, uh, it was a good performance. It wasn't our best, but... Uh, we had some problems early in the year due to the injury, and I think uh, it's turned out very well, and I think we know what we have to do to skate better at the uh, Olympics and the World Championships. So Lillehammer awaits where these two won't be taking the games or their relationship for granted.
Well, I think it's a dream come true just going to the Olympics and competing for your country. I think that we know what we have to do. We just go there and skate the best we can. I think we have a, a very, a very loving relationship. We both have the same goals career-wise, and off the ice, we really enjoy each other's company. If Mino and Sand capture medal in Lillehammer, the earth wouldn't shake, but the skating world might quake a little. That's because the last eight Olympics, the Paris competition has been dominated by Soviet-trained athletes. This time, bidding for the Paris gold are rival teams from Russia, a duo from St. Petersburg who've battled personal turmoil, and a pair from Moscow whose ice capades led to a beautiful baby girl. For most of this century, Russia and its surrounding republics were mysterious places, millions of people living in the shadows of unbending rule. But to watch their athletes on ice was to glimpse a freedom of expression yearning to be exposed. Ekaterina Gordieva and Sergei Grinkov, at the 1988 Olympics, they extended the great Soviet tradition in pairs. At the Alberville Games, it was this couple, Natalia Mishkatunok and Artur Dmitriev. In 1992, they received a standing ovation at the Olympics. Those in attendance enchanted with the ease of their moves. They've made the difficult look so beautiful, pushing the boundaries of their event. Everywhere breathtaking moments, but they've never wanted their athleticism to overtake their art. We, we must uh, show our moves like emotion. Very strong moves, very strong uh, elements. steps, elements, you know, for uh, take everything together for music, you know, but uh, uh, emotion too. When they turned pro, there was no one left to conquer. And since then, there have been difficulties. Natalia battling a weight problem. Now reinstated, there's a challenge to unite them. Gordiev and Grinkov, who will force them to their limits. We saw and we think what we can do better than Gordieva and Grinkov. And, but I think we think about our program it's more. more. Most important. It's, yes, it's more, more important for us. Gordiev and Grinkov have many admirers. Among them, Natalia and Artur's coach, Tamara Moskvina. Gordiev and Grinkov are very, are very dangerous competitors, rivals, as uh, they look very beautiful, they skate very nicely, very easy, very light, uh, very elegant, uh, and uh, she looks uh, very beautiful. Gordieva and Grinkov took their special appeal to pro competitions and continued their dominance, continued to perfect their routines. Although at the 88 Calgary Games, many said they were just about perfect. Now, six years later, they still have reasons to summon another Olympic effort. We decide that we are strong enough already and we can reinstate and try, try to skate in the Olympic Games. Married since the 88 Olympics, there's a new arrival too, a baby girl, Daria. And it seems the proud father, Sergei, is thinking of a skating career for his daughter. Here, he and Daria practice a lift. She's beginning to walk and run around. <laughs> and so every day is something different. She getting, she getting bigger every day. <laughs> We're actually very happy and but we're very missing her when we're far from home. Even now in a new world, the old ways are still with us. Elegant Russians will duel again in the pairs. Contrasting styles, contrasting looks. The couple who mesh so well, a picture of balance and harmony, their love and passion so evident as they perform. They're part of an impressive winning tradition. Again, part of a pairs competition with another daring, dominant Russian couple. But this time, with the Soviet state gone, they're skating not as much for a nation as they are for themselves. That's not the end of the pair story, however. You see, the return of the highly regarded Russians from the pro ranks wasn't welcome news to a Canadian couple fresh off winning the 1993 World Championships. Meet Lloyd. 
Meet Isabel. I think his street is um, getting through everything. Um, nothing for him is an obstacle. She is, you know, the artistic side of our pair and, and no question that softer side of our pair. Lloyd Eisler and Isabel Brasseur have combined to form Canada's number one pairs team. Together on the ice, they're enchanting. Take off the skates and that symmetry fades. Oh yes, they're friends, but hardly two of a kind. For example, check out Lloyd's tattoo. They were completely different. <laughs> Neither one of us is the same in any respect. Our off-ice activities, our on-ice demeanor, our sort of the way we look at life. Uh, I think the only thing that we do have exactly in common is our goals, right? Yep. This accommodating relationship produced a gold medal at last year's Worlds, proving that opposites not only attract, but can also succeed. I think we need a good friendship off the ice, so it shows on the ice that you care for one each other, even if you're not married or if you're not in love, just that you care for the other person. A bronze at the last Olympics built confidence, but left room for improvement. And though there's a deep Olympic field headed by Mishka Tunik and Dmitriev, Eisler isn't backing down. This time we're going and we're going for ourselves. We're not going for the public, we're not going for the media, we're not going for anybody. Uh, last year we proved that we are, you know, on any given day the best team in the world. In this pair, Lloyd provides the confidence, Isabel the conscience, considering life beyond skating. We're lucky to skate and we're lucky to have people around to love us and that we're lucky to that he's around to love me and I'm around to love him and that we're good friends. Coming up, the dance legends, England's smashing Torval and Dean. And later, Nancy Kerrigan and Tanya Harding. It's Team America in turmoil. We'll review the saga, the shock in ladies' singles. We welcome you back to our gold medal preview, a look at the 1994 Olympic figure skating competition. Just ahead, the nightmare that became real for Nancy Kerrigan and how it has affected her preparation for the upcoming Winter Games. But now let's talk for a moment about the dance competition. In Norway, the United States will be represented by one pair, the national champions Elizabeth Punselin and Jared Swallow, who incidentally were married in September. Now in Lillehammer, these newlyweds will find themselves in a loaded dance field full of medal contenders. A field that, in addition to several strong Russian entries, includes a legendary British pair back for an encore. And now let's watch Torval and Dean's historic Olympic performance from the Sarajevo Games. In Olympic City, you'll find Torval and Dean's chief competition for the dance gold. Right here in Lake Placid, the Russians have come to stay. Maya Useva and Alexander Zulin, the defending world champions. Last summer, they left the turbulence of Moscow behind for the quiet of this upstate New York resort with its typical American conveniences. Maya likes the improved phone service. Alexander the chance to watch his favorite old movies. We love American public and American people and we guess they love us. In Norway, Useva and Zulin expect to be crowned again, sure that they can eclipse any royal showing by Torvald and Dean. 
This couple for us legendary of this couple history, and uh, we're not afraid to run in, and uh, uh, we guess this competition will be very interesting. The team who became a world champion, the stunning grace of 16-year-old Oksana Bayul, and an exclusive look at that shameful day in Detroit. In the mid-80s, the skating sensation was Germany's Katarina Witt, who won Olympic gold in 84 and 88. She's back, seeking to become the first since Sonia Henney to win three Olympic titles. But Witt and the rest of the ladies' field will have to deal with the new sensation, a prodigy from Kiev, a gifted teenager with an incredible story. Here's the new face, the teen who could capture your heart in Lillehammer. With her beauty, precocious poise and grace, Oksana Bayul is a swiftly rising star. This tiny dancer has a presence that's breathtaking. Her performances are moving, utterly elegant. It was last year in Prague when it all changed for her overnight. At age 15, she became one of the youngest skaters ever to win the world championship. Suddenly, Oksana's name and face was everywhere. People wanted to know how this radiant young skater with her blades of gold had become the world champion. After my skate, I sat in the dressing room and my coach came flying in and then my second coach kissed me and congratulated me. I didn't understand anything and he said, Oksana, you won. It was a shock to me. I couldn't even have imagined it. But it has been a daunting struggle for Oksana. Her father abandoned the family when she was a baby and her mother died two years ago. Utterly alone, Oksana began sleeping on a cot at the rink where she practiced. When coach Galina Zmievskaya heard of Oksana's plight, she and skater Viktor Petrenko provided Bayul with a new family, one filled with love and support. I told everyone the special is her movements on the ice, because she's her movements on this real looks like a real woman, you know. Also when she's doing the jump that makes her program perfectly. Petrenko is not the only one with great expectations for Oksana. New fans everywhere are hoping for gold when she takes the Olympic ice in Norway. Oksana, however, has set more modest goals. First of all, I do not want to go to the Olympics to win or to win some placement, but I want to go there to show my new program and to please the public. Any placement will be extra, a bonus. For the rest of the world, the bonus will be the chance to watch this dazzling new star as she dances, glides, and lights up the ice in Lillehammer. So young, so talented, we're left to wonder what great things are ahead for Oksana in this sport and in her life. Now to watch Oksana Bayul is to see a skater with extraordinary grace, a skater with the instincts of a ballerina, but ladies figure skating has another side, an athletic side. And right now, the queen of the jumpers is a 20-year-old born in Nice, France. I like the figure, figure skating very much because it's very complete. There is some artistic and some technical, and we can do the both together, mix it, and to be very strong and, and soft at the same time. This is good. She's not like the others, a bit bigger, a bit stronger. Surya Bonnelly likes to take chances. Her routine has been called gymnastics on ice, and in Lillehammer, she's ready to break some new ground. Ladies skating has never seen a quadruple jump completed in competition, and no French woman has ever landed the gold. Surya's mom still guides her career, but additional coaching help has refined her program. This year, she's traded in some of the athletics for artistry. A few jumps are out, but hitting the quad is still a goal, provided she can find suitable footwear. I think the first problem is to find a very good pair of shoes, of boots, and um, I think like this, it should be good, that's why I have to change. I think this is a big problem for me, because I can do everything, but when, when 
you don't get exactly the good material, it's, very, it's difficult to be confident, confident and to be strong. So if the shoe fits, Ms. Bonnelly might be fitted for gold in 94. Next, the incredible events at the national championships, the attack in the aftermath, and the damage to America's Olympic prospects after these messages. Her elegance and beauty has reminded some of the young Katherine Hepburn. And after winning bronze at the 92 Olympics, it appeared a gold medal was in Nancy Kerrigan's immediate future. Then came the 93 World Championships where she finished fifth. Suddenly there was doubt. This season, however, the old Nancy was back and arriving at the U.S. Nationals, she was ready to make a statement to the skating community, but she never got the chance. Here's our Kevin Cusick. So when we came to Detroit, very much excited about the national championships, the first practice we went to was Nancy Kerrigan's. We taped the practice, we shut off the camera, and while we did, a man with a club tried to take away Nancy's dream. It seemed to be a normal practice session for Nancy Kerrigan as she checked in with her coaches, Evie and Mary Scottfold. Although she said she was bothered by a sore leg, she was practicing her free program, getting set to defend her national championship. She finished her skate, exited the ice, and went down this hallway. And that would change her path to the Olympics. While a man waited behind this curtain, barely visible to our camera just seconds before the camera was turned off. This man, who appears as an obscure shadow through magnified video, assaulted the Olympic gold medal favorite. In an instant, the story at Nationals became not who won, but what happened to Nancy Kerrigan. Her crisis unfolded on the world stage as the story at Nationals. Nancy Kerrigan will not be competing in the 1994 legs United States Figure Skating Championships. The reason is a thigh contusion or bruise that's associated with knee swelling. I was just really upset and hurt, angry. It's hard to explain. I, I just really wanted to skate. I can't believe that one human being would deliberately, deliberately hurt her. But someone did deliberately hurt Nancy Kerrigan. We go back to the practice session Thursday, January 6th, and there, invisible to everyone, a man had carefully positioned himself inside Cobo Arena, and everyone wondered, where did he come from? He would have had to have come from this direction, and then he would have been standing behind this blue curtain here. He would have attacked her on the run, hit her. She was right here when she went down, and our, our cameras at that point showed her in the excruciating pain that she was in at that point. There were people helping her, and someone said he ran this way. So if we come down this way, you'll see that he went down this hallway here. And it looks as though on the videotape that there was a possibility he didn't know which way to go. And possibly did not have an escape route. Went out to the right. So he must have apparently run through this door here. He came around. This is where I saw the person working at the arena. And it's this glass door here, plexiglass door, that he popped out. It was full speed, and he just bust through the door and ran straight on out. And I didn't see him. How did he get around the rail? There's a rail here. I know he came through it. He went through like, like, like down and under, but he came through with full force. Did you get a look at him? I yeah, saw I him. I saw him. I saw him. These guys well, here, After this incredible incident, a flurry of activity would heighten this drama. Tall white guy with a with a leather jacket on. Our cameraman, Gene Samuels, continued to roll as security guards frantically tried to find him. But by then, he was gone. And as we watched Nancy's dad carry his daughter to safety, who could have imagined that this was the image we would be left with when Nancy Kerrigan came to nationals? I really wanted to be out there and perform, but it was out of my hands at that point.
Although she did not skate at nationals, she would not be denied a chance to compete at the Winter Olympics in Lillehammer. Nancy will compete again. So as we try to put this bizarre story behind us, a bewildering turn of events now clouds ladies figure skating yet again. A story even more unfathomable, Tanya Harding, the champion of the U.S. Nationals, has ended up in the middle of the events surrounding the attack. She's only 23, but nonetheless a veteran in the ladies' division. As a youth, she honed her skills at a rink at the local mall. Her remarkable success would generate headlines and expectations. In 1991, she was the U.S. national champion and took silver at Worlds. This time, her national title is tainted, a premeditated attack with those accused in the plot, part of Tanya Harding's inner circle. Dorothy's closing comments when we return to the gold... The ultimate test will soon arrive for these exceptional skaters. I remember 1976, the Innsbruck Olympics, and what was going through my mind. In the final moments, these athletes will lace their skates, think of their programs one last time, and most of all, try to relax as they prepare to seize their moment in Olympic history. Thanks for being with us for this gold medal preview.